Hello, hello, hello. Hey, put your bill. Your bill. I can I order my order. You can order. It's an overcast afternoon in the hilly countryside, and five guys are loading a funky Chinese farm truck with white mustard greens stacked five feet deep. Aside from the truck, there are a few signs of modernity. No power poles, no chugging generators, no radios. This is Sat Charkon, an ethnic Danu tribal village in Shan State, Myanmar, in a remote region where farming is life. Everyone grows up on a farm, and few people ever move away. But then, suddenly, the scene shifts. The man atop the truck, Sa Mu Ah, ducks down and begins talking to himself. But no, he has a phone. I was talking to my boss, he says. He wants to know if I have cauliflower. For years, the Myanmar government kept a monopoly on SIM cards through the state-owned telecommunications company. A SIM card is the little chip that allows a phone to connect to a cellular network. As recently as 2009, they cost $2,000 or more each. Then things began to change. The government started opening up, loosening its reign on the people and on SIM cards. Since 2011, the price of that tiny essential plastic chip has dropped dramatically to about $1.50 and the number of cell phone subscriptions has risen from fewer than 600,000 in 2010 to nearly 7 million by the end of 2013, this in a country of more than 50 million people. Suddenly, Burmese people everywhere have cell phones, and they are trickling to the farthest reaches of the countryside. This is due to increase even more rapidly with the introduction of two new private foreign cellular service providers by the end of the year. According to Sam Yu Ah, on the back of that mustard truck, the upshot of cheap SIM cards is this. It is easier to connect with people. Still, there are challenges, namely money. Technology changes are happening more quickly and thoroughly in Myanmar's towns and cities, where incomes are higher. Burmese people can buy knockoff Chinese iPhones for 70 bucks, but the average Burmese makes about $1,700 a year, and often much less if they are farming. Villages like Satcharkon traditionally relied on barter for survival. Many villagers, especially among older generations, have no bank accounts and accumulate very little money. That means a phone is still a luxury for many. Uchi Mint is an advisor to the Satcharkon village chief. He lives in a large, airy wood and concrete house just down the road from where Samu Ah is loading mustard. Uchi Mint has a Chinese Huawei smartphone, which he uses only for calls. He doesn't know how to use any of the smartphone functions. When he needs more minutes, he travels the rough 10-mile dirt road to Kala to buy a $5 top-up card. That $5 top-up lasts about two and a half months, he says, because we only accept incoming calls. Uchi Mint may be a local bigwig, but he is also a vegetable farmer. When asked why he thinks the government lowered the price of SIM cards, Uchi Mint says, <laughs> That descent creates a gap between the farms and city. It's similar to the gap between Myanmar and most of the rest of Asia. It's a gap that is quickly shown by the comparative phone penetration rates between Myanmar and its five largest trading partners, China, Thailand, Singapore, Malaysia, and India. Myanmar's rates are similarly low, even when just compared to the rates of other developing countries. And again, when compared to the Asia and Pacific region as a whole, or even Africa, Myanmar has a lot of catching up to do. In the economic capital, Liangon, Mong Mong Le, the vice chairman of the Union of Myanmar Federation of Chambers of Commerce, lays out the problem succinctly. But in fact, you have to reset your watch about 50 years back. We are, we are that far behind. Many villages are dark at night from a lack of electricity. The road system is a shambles and only slowly improving. The country's train system is no better. It dates back to the British Raj. One traveler called the experience of traveling by rail from Yangon to Mandalay like riding a galloping horse on a boat on a rough sea. Still, the train is a critical form of transportation, especially for farmers in the countryside. Take, for example, the local train that runs from Kala in Shan State to Tazi, a town on the main highway artery connecting Mandalay and Yangon. 
It is 100 kilometers in two hours by road, but about nine hours by train. Yet this is how many farmers, like those in Satyarkon, get their produce to larger markets. It's a slow system, ripe for some improvement. Cell phones are helping to make that happen. In years past, many farmers had no way of communicating directly with middlemen, buyers, or wholesalers unless they went in person. They didn't know what buyers specifically wanted or needed. Now, as Som Yuah says, he can take calls from his boss, a buyer, who tells him, please send cauliflower. And the next day, that cauliflower is on the train. On a Saturday in May, several markets worth of cauliflower, tomatoes, limes, potatoes, and, of course, mustard, fill the cargo cars on the Kala to Tazi train. Produce is stuffed in sacks beneath the seats. Traders on the train will pick up more vegetables at tiny mountain stations along the way, and all that will be resold in Tazi and transported and resold again in Mandalay and Yangon. In Mandalay, the country's second largest city and the economic hub of the north, Warehouse managers echo the farmers' thoughts about cell phones. Nini Tun has found improvement. He trades dried beans, the country's second largest export. It's easier now, since he got a phone. Before, farmers and middlemen like him had to meet face-to-face -to, -face to make deals. Now it can be done much more quickly and cheaply on a phone. But that only started a couple of years ago. Down the road, Ko Mike, owner of Ong Chung Myat Rice Trading, talks about how technology has changed his life. A few years ago, he ponied up the money to get a smartphone and an expensive SIM card so he could talk directly with his workers and other traders at the Chinese border. He figured that even at several hundred dollars, the SIM card was a cheaper deal than driving all day on bad roads twice a week, every week, just to talk. Now he connects with people at the border through his big white Samsung phone. And now, in addition to calling his workers at the border, he shares price information with other Burmese traders on a private Facebook group. And when he wants to communicate directly with Chinese traders, they tap on WeChat, since Facebook is blocked in China. The future is arriving slowly in Taotsu, an ethnic Pao village. It is perched atop the ridge of a high hill in Shan State, a few hours' walk from Satcharkon. One small dirt and rock road runs through the village. Until a few years ago, that road was just a trail, but now it's big enough for vegetable trucks to take the village's produce to market. Nan Noon has spent all of her life here, farming garlic and potatoes just like most of her neighbors. She says there hasn't been much change here in her 42 years. The village life remains much the same. Yes, the new road went in a few years ago, but she doesn't see it as such a big deal. But Nan Noon will admit to one thing changing in her village, cell phones. She says there are quite a lot in Chaozu, although she doesn't have one. I don't really need to call anyone, she says. Consequently, some villagers use their phones in other ways. A day's walk from Nan Noon's hilltop village, a half dozen farmers take a rest in a carrot field near Kala. A young woman sits with her friends, tinny music wafting from her cell phone. The phone, it's a business tool, it's a radio. It's a signal for a new future in Myanmar. For farmers. For everyone.